All right. So representativeness in Alzheimer's disease research uh, and in dementia research in general is an ethical as well as a scientific issue. Um, despite it being a legal mandate, BIPOC groups remain underrepresented and underincluded in clinical research. So uh, there was a, a law that was first uh, introduced in 1993. Uh, it has been updated in 2003. Um, and uh, people are still having difficulty adhering to it. Uh, So the United States population is changing, becoming ever increasingly diverse. By the way, uh, I'm starting out by giving you the motivation for the research that we'll be discussing today. And here are our most recent census results. Non-Hispanic whites now comprise about 59% of the overall population. Hispanic or Latinx group is the fastest growing ethnic group now comprising about 19% of the US population. The Black or African-American group comprises nearly 14% of the population. And another change is that there's an increasing proportion of folks who are identify themselves as multi-ethnic, now currently at 3%. Despite the proportions in the population, people of color are grossly under-included in clinical trials. Now, to date, there have been four major phase three clinical trials for dementia drugs. Aduhelm had two trials, the Emerge and the Engage trials. Lucanamab and Denanamab both had one. And uh, here are the inclusion rates by ethnicity that I, I pulled across all four. Um, Note that the non-Hispanic whites comprise between 75 and 95% of these samples. Each of these samples had at least 1,500 people in them. So what did that mean? <laughs> that meant that in some samples, there were as few as one, if any, American Indian Alaska na Native. Um, uh, sometimes there were as many as 10 Black people, sometimes um, very few, less than that. Um, the reason why there seem to be a representative amount of Asian uh, individuals is because they were actually drawing from their samples in, in Asia, not in the US. Okay. And so, but if you simply compare these inclusion rates in clinical trials to the proportions of individuals in the population, you conclude that the numbers don't add up. For example, Non-Hispanic whites comprise approximately 59% of the population, but 75 to 96% of some of the clinical trials. So clearly non-Hispanic whites are overwhelmingly represented in these clinical trials. Blacks on the other hand, comprise nearly 14% of our population, yet they only make up up to 3% of the clinical trial samples. We're, perhaps the exception of the Asian participants, and I explained why, the rest of the non-white groups are disproportionately under-included in dementia uh, clinical trials. So repeat, pulling across the four major phase three clinical trials for dementia drugs, BIPOC participants have been grossly under-included. Yet the data indicate that people diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia are disproportionately female and from BIPOC groups. So it appears the groups most likely to be affected by the disorder are least likely to be included in the clinical trials for the most promising treatments. Isn't that the operational definition of disparity? And health disparities are a form of injustice and are inherently unethical. So it is probably no surprise then that according to studies reported by the Alzheimer's Association, Pretty recently, compared to white participants, BIPOC groups are less likely to believe that they too will benefit from an Alzheimer's cure. And I wanted to do something about that. So what do we know at this point? We know that there are some very promising Alzheimer's dementia drugs, some of which are actually targeting more than symptoms. 
they're targeting etiological mechanisms, such as the overproduction of amyloid or the excess accumulation of tau. However, unfortunately, the clinical trials for these drugs were based on limited samples with extremely low percentages of diverse populations. So it's unclear just how effective or even how appropriate these therapies are for non-white members of our communities. We also know that one way of determining who is most likely to benefit from these therapies based, you know, based on their pathology and the staging of their risk or their illness involves biomarkers. And we know that we're not seeing people, we're not seeing diverse peoples in the biomarker studies. Failure to include historically underrepresented groups in biomarker research therefore contributes to the ongoing health disparities in Alzheimer's research, clinical trials, and healthcare outcomes. What might you ask is a biomarker? A biomarker or a biological marker or biomarker for short is any human characteristic that can be used as a clinical indication indicator of a normal process, pathogenic process, or response to an exposure or intervention. Biomarkers can be used as a clinical indicator for diagnostic purposes. That is, is a disease present? And if so, what stage is it at? Is it at? A biomarker can be used for prognostic purposes. For example, how likely will I respond to this class of drug compared to another type? The other way in which biomarkers are used and the focus for today's talk is as prognostic tools to provide an estimate of one's risk for developing a given disease. So more as a predictor uh, in that sense, not a predictor for individual response to treatment, though that's also used and it's, um, as you can see, biomarkers are promising for personalized medicine in risk prediction, disease staging, and tailoring treatments. Uh, biomarkers can indicate a person's relative risk for a health condition or underlying changes in health, signaling the presence of a disease many years before symptoms of an illness may appear. And a good example of a biomarker is the hemoglobin A1C test. Here's a paper that we recently published in 2021, where we summarized the extant literature comparing AD biomarkers in black and non-Hispanic white samples. And when we, when we looked at the data, it quickly, or when we looked at the literature, it quickly became apparent that the rates for biomarker research participation were lower for ethnic and racialized communities. There were relatively few studies, less than 10 at the time, which examined AD biomarkers in black cohorts. Thus, if we see differences in amyloid pathology between black and white samples, are these differences reflecting the specialized samples drawn from ADRC uh, registries, or do they reflect something else, perhaps related to social determinants of health? Um, we, we really don't know. We saw that overall, there are seemingly lower levels of tau pathology in blacks and African-Americans, yet, there's greater or equivalent cognitive impairment. Now, does this reflect some additional factors such as vascular involvement, or does it reflect poor educational quality of the schools, less cognitive reserve, and so on? Clearly, there's a need for more studies with more diverse populations that can be ascertained more broadly. And this brings us to um, the project that I, I instigated, the U Bigger study. You Bigger or Understanding Biomarker and Genetic Research Participation is led by myself and Dr. Carrie Gleason. We conducted an anonymous online survey to in investigate people's willingness to engage in biological or biomarker uh, studies for dementia. And we were specifically interested in identifying the factors that make people more willing to engage in biomarker research. Um, actually, the study is bigger than that. I'm just going to talk about the Alzheimer's part today. We're actually also looking at biomarkers for other brain diseases as well, like schizophrenia. But we were interested in what are the factors that contribute to folks' reluctance. And our goal was to help make scientific research more user-friendly and to make sure that the needs of the various diverse communities were expressed upfront when research projects are in the planning stages. 
and we used various recruitment strategies, including ads, presence at community fairs, uh, word of mouth, presentations at various talks, and crowdsourcing. Um, so here's a study overview. Again, do bigger, understanding biomarker and genetic research. And the goal, of course, is uh, to help facilitate greater inclusion in and benefit from, oops, that says future schizophrenia. It should be future schizophrenia and Alzheimer's research. Okay. Now, um, people from the BIPOC communities must participate in research in order to benefit from research advances. So here's an example of the kind of presentation or the ad that I would go to various sources, whether it's a community group, a group of uh, uh, um, community leaders, and so forth, uh, church groups, et cetera. A um, hundred black men, the whole bit. So in addition to addressing the under-inclusion of BIPOC community members from the institute, investigator and institutional side, there was also this need, this press, to work within communities to engage, recruit, and retain participants. So, um, you know, the first thing that became apparent to me was that there's a dearth of quantitative research on this topic. There's lots of focus groups, and they have their place, but we wanted a large-scale study. I wanted to hear from a lot of different types of people, not just people who are already engaged in a research registry or people who know someone or you know upper middle class people who are typically the ones who are included in these focus groups. So um, I wanted, I paved the, pounded the pavement as they say, and this is an example of some of the text that was used in flyers that were sent out. I gave a fair amount of presentations and said things like, we need to be represented in the research. We need to express our concerns. We should benefit from research advances. Um, we can influence the way science is done. People really resonated to that. And I always concluded with res rep representation matters, inclusion matters. Um, note the power of being able to say we. Um, I have no that doubt that being a researcher of color helped open doors and convince some people to participate in the study. Whether I was talking to um, a group of uh, Native American, Alaska Native, American Indian people, or Latinx, it, it didn't matter. It, I was a non-white um, researcher and that tended to make people at least pay attention. Um, and yes, when I sent out recruitment letters, I attached a picture. Now, um, I have to tell you that this is only part of our data. Uh, I So the numbers are, I think they're large, but they do not include our Latinx group yet. Um, I'm, I'm just focusing today on African-Americans, non-white, non-Hispanic whites, and American Indian Alaska native groups. Okay, so here's our conceptual model of factors yeah. likely to yeah. influence Willingness. No, you can to... keep it because I have my this on. May yeah. I ask that you mute yourself so that when I'm talking, um, others can hear? Thanks. So we started with a conceptual model of factors likely to influence willingness to be tested for the presence of a dementia biomarker. We expected that there would be between racialized group differences in biomarker testing willingness. And we expected that there would be between group differences in knowledge and stigmatizing attitudes about Alzheimer's dementia and hypothesized that attitudes towards research would influence biomarker testing willingness. We predicted that across all groups, more positive attitudes towards research would increase willingness to engage in biomarker testing. However, we also expected that the um, BIPOC members would endorse less positive attitudes uh, toward research due to their historical mistreatment. And these are the sample characteristics for the sub, the sub study that I'm gonna talk about today. As you can see, we purposely oversampled BIPOC participants. This was a mostly male middle-aged sample. Significantly more of the African-American participants in our study were female, whereas more of the non-Hispanic white participants were male. 
Uh, I do want to point out that it is significant that we uh, recruited a lot of middle-aged people. Most of the studies to date had elderly people. Okay. Um, our sample, our sample is a lot more representative of the general population than most research studies as well. Nearly one third of our participants did not have a college degree. And according to the 2022 US Census, only 33.7% of the US population age 25 and above have a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, and you'll note that uh, only 34% of our participants were uh, first degree relatives of someone with dementia. Where did the participants come from? Well, th this was an online study, so we were able to reach nearly every state through recruitment, except for uh, Vermont and Maine, and I cannot explain that. Okay. Um, we used uh, a we used a admixture of questionnaire items. So after providing informed consent, we had questions regarding socio-demographic characteristics, as well as attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge pertaining to research, um, dementia, Alzheimer's uh, in general, uh, dementia in general, Alzheimer's particularly, and biomarker testing. The survey included also something called the RAQ, Research Attitudes Questionnaire, it's a validated measure. We use the seven item version and um, the entire survey was de delivered by Qualtrics. So the three groups mean composite scores uh, were one of the things that we looked at. And um, we looked at knowledge and stigma. I'll talk about knowledge first. Knowledge was assessed with two survey questions. Uh, one regarding awareness of a distinction between dementia and delirium, the other assessing understanding of the levels of severity of Alzheimer's dementia, such as whether having dementia meant needing assistance all the time that was reverse coded. The groups differed in terms of their knowledge about dementia with the um, African-American participants reporting having less knowledge about dementia than the two other, two other groups. That's significant because a disproportionate number of African-Americans are actually diagnosed with dementia. Okay. Oopsie. All right. We derived a, now let's look at the right side of this, this histogram. We derived a mean composite stigma score based on five survey items. The survey items assessed perceptions Regarding the dangerousness of people with dementia, beliefs that people with dementia can contribute to the community, that was reverse scored, and feelings in response to receiving a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or learning that a loved one had received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. For example, I would feel ashamed, I would feel fearful, versus I would feel motivated to do something. That one was reverse scored as well. All right. The three groups differed in how much they agreed with uh, statements expressing stigmatized attitudes about Alzheimer's dementia. The American Indian Alaska Native group endorsed significantly more agreement with stigmatizing statements than the other two groups. Um, I should tell you, uh, I just realized that I may not have told you that we had um, about 50% 50, 50 or maybe I did. Um, I just want to remind you again, we had, uh, if I hadn't told you, we had 725 uh, non-Hispanic whites, 599 African Americans and 120 uh, American Indian Alaska Natives. And to our knowledge, this is the first study that has ever uh, engaged this many um, Alaska, American Indian Alaska Natives. And we, we do need to do better. And this is only part of our sample. I have a larger sample now. So this is very exciting to us. Now, here is a histogram that shows the distribution of total RAQ scores. And this is, now this was, based on 100 and 
1,444 uh, individuals. And I am really excited about this data because uh, the larger sample shows us even, you know, shows a very similar pattern. Um, it doesn't change much, um, but it's a seven item scale. It's a Likert type scale ranging from one strongly disagree to five strongly agree. And so that the minimum uh, score, total score was seven, the maximum total score was 35. Now, most of the time when this scale has been used, um, they usually max out. I mean, we usually see non-Hispanic whites with a mean score really high, like, you know, 29 or 30. And um, we didn't see that here. We saw the overall total mean score around 27.8. Um, and uh, it, it was very interesting. We had a nice, really a large sample here. And you can see the frequency of respondents with each particular score on the ordinate. Okay. Now, um, we a group uh, by gender identity, ANOVA, of total RAQ scores revealed a main effect of ethno-racial group. Both the African-American and the American Indian Alaska Native uh, participants had significantly lower total RAQ scores than the non-Hispanic white group. Now, the higher the RAQ score, the more positive one's attitude towards research. So this is already telling us that the two BIPOC groups in this in this sample, in this survey, um, have lower or less positive attitudes towards, towards research or biomedical research. The gender, so what I have here is I have, I have the three ethno-racial groups uh, in the analysis. I've got males in dark blue, females in gray, and then in this uh, sky blue or whatever, I've got the total for that for that ethno-racial group. So if you just look here, that's the that's the group that the sky blue would be the 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 ethno-racial group. That's that main effect. Then we looked at gender identity. Okay. And the gender identity was was uh not effect, not significant. But there was a statistically significant interaction between ethno-racial group membership and gender identity. Um, and you see it here in the non-Hispanic white group. That's where we actually found it. Um, the non-Hispanic white females expressed significantly more positive um, attitudes towards research as indicated by higher total RAQ scores than the non-Hispanic white males, okay? No other significant differences emerged. So what am I saying? I'm saying that for the BIPOC groups, you know, both males and females were not really trusting, or I, sh I shouldn't give away my story yet, were not really uh, feeling positive towards research. Okay, now here are the actual uh, RAQ items again, and I want to really call your attention to two of them. Um, and I, I have them identified by their actual item numbers, even in the seven item score scale, this is how they're identified. So um, as expected, the ethno-racial groups differed on several of the RAQ items, including RAQ3 regarding trust in medical researchers and RAQ8, the item regarding the overall safety of biomedical research. And I'm hoping that later on, someone will ask me a question about why I expected this. Um, and anyway, in any case, in terms of RAQ item three, a significantly smaller proportion of the African-American group agreed that medical researchers could be trusted. Um, I'll give away part of that story now. Given the collective community awareness of the Tuskegee study and, or I should say the Tuskegee untreated syphilis study and the case of Henrietta Lacks, we were not surprised by this finding. Um, the American Indian Alaska Native group responded in a similar direction though the difference from the non-Hispanic white participants in this sub-analysis did not reach statistical significance. Our sample is now up to 352 and it does reach statistical significance. Okay. Um, 
There was an even greater group difference in response to RAQ item eight, participating in medical research is generally safe. The non-Hispanic white group was significantly more likely to agree with that statement than the other two participant groups. Now let's look, let's switch over. Now we have attitudes towards research. Let's look at how they feel attitudes towards biomarkers. In our sample, the majority, 71% of the participants agreed that overall biomarkers are useful, okay? In fact, we found no difference in the proportion of ethno-racial groups who agreed that overall biomarkers are useful. Although 71% of the sample felt, yes, biomarkers are useful, and the groups did not differ in this regard, the ethno-racial groups did differ in their expressed willingness to engage in any type of biomarker testing for dementia. I want that to sink in for a moment because there seems to be a disconnect. What we did is we, we explained what a biomarker was. We gave examples. We said A, you know, A1C. Most people understand the risk for, for diabetes and the whole bit. We explained hypertension and we talked about, you know, diastolic, systolic over diastolic, et cetera. And they're like, yeah, that's useful. Okay. And then we gave them a, a list of questions about biomarkers in general. And they're like, yeah, this is, this is useful. And then we asked them, would you be willing to engage in biomarker testing? And that's when we started seeing differences emerge again. So theoretically, they say, yes, it's useful. Yes, we get it. And we think this is a good thing. But there are significant ethno-racialized group differences in terms of willingness to engage in biomarker testing. Non-Hispanic whites were more likely to be willing to engage in biomarker testing for Alzheimer's disease-related dementia than either the African-Americans or the American Indian Alaska Natives. We then, a larger proportion, okay, uh, it was really, really obvious, okay. A larger proportion, like hands down. So that we then combined the African-Americans and the American Indian Alaska Native participants into a singular group, a BIPOC group. And BIPOC, as most of you know, stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. So we combined them into this BIPOC group to give us more statistical power for testing our conceptual model of what factors predicted willingness to undergo any type of Alzheimer's disease biomarker testing. Because obviously not everyone said, no, they wouldn't do it. But a lot more of the BIPOC group said, no, they were not going to do biomarker testing. And we were just asking them hypothetically, you know, we said, we're not going to hold you to this, but would you be willing? Okay. Here are the results of testing our model using the data, the, the survey data. And the, um, the standardized coefficients are provided on the PATH model. I'm going to walk you through this. The model fit the data with all the usual criteria suggested by Hugh and Bentler, uh, namely comparative fit index, goodness of fit, the Tucker-Lewis index, root mean square, error of approximation, you, you name it, we met it. Um, so uh, what, did, what did we find? We found, let's look at family history. Participants with more family members with Alzheimer's dementia had greater knowledge, okay? They also had greater stigma. Towards dementia, that we were surprised. And they had less willingness to engage in any Alzheimer's dementia biomarker testing. Again, that was a bit of a surprise for us. Okay. Oh, go back. I've got more. <laughs> Participants with higher educational attainment not surprisingly had more knowledge about dementia. They had higher 
RA key scores. So they had more favorable attitudes towards research. Well, that's good. Okay, female identifying uh, participants held more stigmatizing attitudes or beliefs about Alzheimer's dementia. I'm surprised about that. Um, and, uh, hmm, okay. Now, the BIPOC group. The BIPOC participants in general had uh, fewer, they held fewer stigmatizing uh, views about dementia, but they had lower RAQ scores, okay? And overall, the RAQ scores were the biggest predictor of willingness to engage in any Alzheimer's dementia biomarker testing, Alzheimer's disease biomarker testing, excuse me. I mean, that's big. <laughs> so participants with higher RA key scores were more willing to undergo AD biomarker testing. So what did we learn? What did we learn from our respondents? First of all, our community-based diverse group of participants really told us a lot and we're grateful. First of all, many really do not understand what Alzheimer's disease related dementia is, nor do they understand or know that there are stages and levels of severity. Um, many harbor misconceptions regarding people affected with dementia. They think they're more dangerous and there's a lot of stigmatizing attitudes that are prevalent, okay. There were significant ethno-racial group differences in attitudes towards research. Um, the African-American and American Indian Alaska Native groups expressed significantly less positive attitudes overall. Um, overall, everyone saw the value in biomarkers and testing. Not everyone, but at least 70%, 71%. Um, despite seeing the value in biomarkers and testing, the ethno-racial group differences in willingness to engage in the biomarker testing exists. And um, one of the things that was the largest driver of those differences was attitudes towards research. Okay. What are the implications of all this? Well, first of all, greater research engagement, recruitment, and retention of BIPOC community members requires considerable investment. And this project is the first step, but it's only the first step. Um, factors influencing willingness to engage. Now, this is the part that gave us hope that these factors influencing willingness to engage in biomarker testing are modifiable, okay? I mean, we, we saw that people really lack knowledge about these things, so we can, we can educate them. They lack trust. We, we can try to foster more trust. We can acknowledge the misdeeds of the past and try to move forward. And we can work with researchers and institutions on how to earn the trust. Um, and we can invest in alliance building with these historically under-included populations. What was that? Community-based research participation? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, findings point toward the need for outreach and engagement programs to occur before attempting genetic and biomarker research recruitment. And altogether, tailored engagement would provide a path to build inclusive clinical trials for um, dementia biomarkers. So it's important that all the members from all groups have a seat at the table. And I'd like to thank the study participants, the community groups who assisted in publicizing the study, my collaborators, especially um, Carrie Gleason, uh, the Department of Medicine for their grant funding and NIH uh, 
Institutes of Aging. So with that, uh, 